Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneers shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Canna Cribs Podcast. Welcome back to another Canna Cribs podcast. I'm your host, Nick Morin, and today's interview is with Dave Esser, one of the founding partners of both Pincana and Radical Genetics out of Michigan. In this interview, we shatter stereotypes, go into the history and origin of Radical Genetics and Pincana, and give an update on the current path of curing cancer with cannabis. Enjoy. Finally, an organic foliar spray that rapidly corrects nutrient deficiencies and accelerates plant growth. Welcome to Mist by Foop, our podcast partner for this episode. I'll teach you more about the Mist product line throughout this interview with Dave. Dave, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, and we went out there and did a full-on Canna Cribs episode at Pincana. There were some questions that we left unanswered, and I'd love to do a deep dive today on a lot of your personal journey with the plant, radical genetics, and uh, some other questions that come up. Awesome, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so tell me, how did you get involved with cannabis in the first place? Does this start pretty young with you? Yeah, so cannabis has always been a medicine for me. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with ADD, and so parents had me on a couple of uh, pharmaceuticals. I never liked that stuff. Um, so at a young age, I began smoking cannabis. Uh, we have a park that's in Southern Michigan called Heinz Park. It's got a long meandering 20 mile stretch of road, and nothing but parks. And a friend of mine and his older brother said, Hey, you know, come on by after school one day and down to the park. We went, pulled out a bag. What's that? Got some weed. All right, let's try it. Literally old corn cob style pipe and a <laughs> uh, little tin foil in there for a screen. And uh, that was my first experience with cannabis. And it made me feel really, really outstanding. It helped me to focus immediately. And uh, I didn't get that high. I just was able to focus a lot more. I don't know that it was shitty weed or just the first experience because from uh, first time experiences with other people smoking uh, for the first time, I've seen that same thing where they don't get yeah, extremely tolerance. high the first time. Right, or, or, or some people are to the moon and it's overwhelming. So for yeah. me, it was uh, pretty easy going, but very, very cerebral. And I was able to concentrate and focus. And from that day forward, I knew cannabis was for me. So by the time I was 13, I was going in on bags with those friends and a couple other people. And we'd split that thing over the week and, and have a bag of weed to smoke for the week. Um, and... By the time I was 13 and a half, I was taking seeds instead of throwing them in the weeds uh, and making weeds with them. Um, I worked at a greenhouse uh, for 15 years from the time I was 12 till I was 27. And I would take the seeds and start trying to cultivate them at the greenhouse. Wow. So it was within a matter of two years that we realized the greenhouse owner keeps finding them. <laughs> he knows those aren't geraniums. So he's pitching them out and we started planting in the back of the of the greenhouse behind it in the compost piles. And uh, by the third summer, we were getting our first successful harvest. So uh, from then, cannabis has been a medicine for me and an important part of my life, yeah. uh, you know, for the, the next 30, 35 years. Wow. And you started working at that greenhouse pretty young. I was 12 years old. Uh, I wanted to buy a dirt bike. My dad had already got me a go-kart and a mini bike and <laughs> this and that. And I said, hey, you know, I'm ready to, to get a dirt bike. He says, I'm done spoiling you. You know, you start saving your money, get a job. I'll match a dollar for dollar. And wow. uh, ultimately, I looked down at the end of the road there. Uh, three houses from mine was a dirt road and a farm. I went down to the farm and I said, hey, Farmer Wilkins, I need a job. And he said, you see the size of those combine tires, kid? <laughs> said, this isn't for you, man. He says, you look down there, you see those greenhouses? I said, yeah. He said, go down and ask Bill. He'll give you a job. That's more up your alley. So wow. I walked down to the greenhouse. Uh, I looked for Bill. You, Bill, yeah. Said, I'm looking for a job. You know, Farmer Wilkins sent me down here, sent me to get a work permit at the high school. And I went to work when I was in the uh, summer of 12 years old. Incredible. So not only did you have a passion for plants at a young age, but you developed a work ethic. 
and, and the ability to kind of go in each day as a 12 year old and learn and soak up so much. That's, that's very special. Yeah. I mean, I, then my dad instilled that in me at a very young age. I had a paper route by the time I was 10 and it was the Detroit free press, which is our morning newspaper. So my ass was up at four thirty <laughs> in the morning doing my, you know, uh, advertisements and stuff and papers and pedaling a bike with saddlebags on it. So you know, I had already been working at a regular steady job. I mean, you're seven days a week with the newspaper. People, you know, aren't into newspapers anymore. Everything's digital. But, you know, 35, 40 years ago, that was the way that mainstream media was, was you know, exposed to everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, I've been at it. And I, I firmly believe in strong work ethic. I look for that in all of my friends and, and employees. And, and that's what really makes the world go round. And that's what's made, in my opinion, the Completely. United States as successful as we've been. Mm. Yeah, completely agree with you. And when we were out there filming, um, I remember you told me how early you wake up to get to the farm each day. Um, it's impressive. You you have quite the drive there and back every day. Uh, just shows how committed and dedicated you are to running that facility. Yeah, and, and actually, I have now gotten a rental house here. So oh, Monday sweet. mornings, Monday mornings, th 3 a.m., I'm up, drive up here. Uh, Wednesdays, I typically go home to visit the family and uh, the baby. And then I'm back up at 3.30 Thursday morning on my way back up here and then uh, repeat it again, go home Friday and start back on Monday all over. When I'm coming into work, I try to get here by 5.30 or 6. Um, sometimes it's 6.30, but uh, it's nice to be here to get everything double checked before we get production rolling and to just uh, put the morning stamp of approval on everything. Totally. And we also talked quite a bit um, in our downtime. Uh, you are a stereotype crusher, right? Uh, Christian, uh, pro-gun, gun owner. Um, cannabis is used as a medicine, not you know just recreational. Um, these are a lot of uh, large stereotypes and misconceptions that people all around the world have uh, with people that use uh, the plant. And it's a medicine to you. Um, talk to me about these, these other areas. Sure. So it's it's not been a long time that my church and the people that I see from church have become acceptable to cannabis. It certainly was the devil's lettuce for many years right. of my early Christianity. And uh, it's taken not only myself in our local communities, but the country and the world to show a lot of these elderly uh, that that was all propaganda, that it's mm -hmm. all bullshit and that there's medicinal value here. So, you know, as a young kid, I was an altar boy. Uh, later in life, I didn't really go to church a whole lot until, uh, you know, the last 20 years or so. So I did take a hiatus for a little bit. And on being on both sides of the fence and being around friends that are and are not Christian, I've, I've seen it, I've lived it. And uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of times when you feel like you want to use some medicine before church and then walk into church, if there's a smell there, you're fearing that people are going to be, you know, snapping their necks behind you, looking at you, judging, and, you know, judging and, and saying, what the heck? Uh, so it wasn't until recently that my church, through treatment of a lot of the elderly members there, uh, has really came to embrace it. My priest is completely open with it, the pastor of the church, and I now take care of uh, probably 10 or 12 of the church members um, for different things from cancer to just pain and inflammation as the onset of uh, arthritis is, is plaguing people or um, things like uh, diabetes. Uh, one of the people suffers from diabetes and is getting some relief from some uh, slightly tuned up CBD oil with a couple of uh, percent of THC in it. And so uh, after educating, starting off with one individual whom was highly respected at the church and making my way through, they now realize and completely accept it as one of the blessings that God has given us. Mm. I have some uh, Jewish partners and they too feel that it is a mitzvah. Uh, it, it is a gift from God. It's a blessing. Um, and so several religions, if you go back pre-propaganda, it was very common and accepted. Everywhere. Uh, it, it wasn't until, you know, the early 1900s that we ran everything out and coined it a bad thing. And so uh, I think it's going to take a lot more time. But fortunately, a lot of us are in the fast lane of uh, not only accepting it medically, but, but recreationally. And, and even though, you know, it's not medicine for everybody, it does prove that uh, it is not causing people to become rapists and crazy things that we saw in Reefer Madness. Right. So, um, 
with the church, you know, incense is a big part of the mass and, and it's a, uh, it's a component that's been in the Bible for, you know, since its creation. Uh, so I find cannabis to fall right into the realm of incense with additional benefits. Um, so for me, uh, I, I like to be the example around church and, and around just uh, fellow Christians that there is nothing wrong with cannabis, that it is one of the many blessings that we do receive from the good Lord. Um, and then that carries over to, you know, other beliefs with, with gun ownership. Obviously, I respect all lives, but I also respect the lives of my family members and my peers. And I, I feel that we have the right to protect our liberties and our freedoms. And uh, from day one of the founding of this country, we've had firearms here mm -hmm. to assist us in doing that. So as a cannabis owner, I think, or as a cannabis user and a gun owner, I think that uh, we, we need to continue to press with the government to uh, relinquish its means of some of these uh, mandatory minimums and things. If you're caught with cannabis and a firearm, uh, depending on what state you're in and depending mm -hmm. on which officer arrests you, you <clears> might be <throat> looking at a mandatory jail sentence of, of a minimum amount of time. Yeah. So, you know, we have to continue to lobby the, the wars, are being had, the battles are being won, but we, we, we really have to win this war. And uh, I think it's gonna continue with us writing our legislators and letting them know, now that we have cannabis, that you can go to a store and pick up similar to cigarettes or beer or to going to a pharmacy to get your medicine, that we should not be being prosecuted for protecting ourselves while we do so. Right. For me personally, Dave, uh, my mom actually has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she goes to church, you know, once a week, maybe sometimes two times a week. Yeah. Um, I don't think she would ever imagine being medicated inside church. She still kind of falls and, and has that stigma, right? So what would you advise her? What would you advise everyone else around the world that um, enters a, a house of God, if you will, um, for their religion or organized religion? on a weekly basis that do use cannabis as medicine, what's your advice to them uh, when it comes to other people in their congregation that might be you know, turning around, might be judging? So I, I think it starts with it being recognized as medicine. I, I wouldn't condone people going into church drunk. Uh, so when you're looking at things from a recreational standpoint, I think it needs to remain for an after church activity. But you know, any of us who have been on prescription drugs Nobody ever contemplates going to church after taking your morning meds and eating your breakfast. And it shouldn't be any different for cannabis. If you take a, an over-the-counter Benadryl, you know, Benadryl is the exact same ingredient as they use for insomnia in some of the sleep over-the-counter sleep medications. Mm -hmm. So it's no different than any of your other prescription or OTC drugs. Everybody knows themselves and their relationships with God better than you know, somebody looking in from the outside. If you feel that it's impacting or impairing your ability to have a, a successful prayer life and to have uh, a very tight bond with God, obviously when I go to church, being in his presence there with the community, I mean, God's with us all day, every day, 24 seven. But when you get into an area of community that everybody is there in worship and praise, there's a power there. The Bible says, the good Lord says, you know, when two or more come together in my name, I am there. And so there is that power there. Why would I want to prevent myself from going there feeling normal? For me, the use of cannabis as medicine every day makes me feel normal. It in fact brings me closer to God because my ailments and my conditions are not impacting my prayer life. And so while I'm there, while I'm trying to be as deep as I ever am in prayer with the Lord and in praise with the Lord, I feel that everybody should recognize that if you're using cannabis as medicine, it's only going to help you heighten your relationship with God. Hmm. Now, if you're somebody who recognizes that, although I have medicinal benefits from it, it makes me very tired or cloudy, then I can understand you know yourself that it may impact that, that hour or two or three of prayer life, and you may opt to wait until after church, but certainly shouldn't be looked at as something that would impair it, because for me and for many other people, it's a, a medicine that we use daily, and it only helps to enhance our quality of life, which puts us in a better spiritual place, which allows us to grow closer to the Lord. Yeah, have a stronger connection. I completely uh, agree with that. 
Um, when I was in Arizona, I had a medical card uh, to go to a medical dispensary and you know buy whatever I wanted. Sure. Um, and at that same time, there was a law in Arizona, which is a very pro-gun state, um, where if you had your medical cannabis card, you could not own uh, a fire weapon. Um, I, I don't recall the details. Um, I'd have to you know pull it up to, to reference. But um, when I found that out, um, it, it made me think how many uh, citizens of Arizona, residents of Arizona that own guns would not go out and get a medical card because of that. And how many patients would be suppressed to getting you know clean meds? And of course, there's people growing at home, and and uh, you can access cannabis many other ways. But um, what are your thoughts on that? To states that have uh, you know the restriction of getting cannabis and owning a gun at the same time? Well, my thoughts are that it's terrible policy. Obviously, it's bad on behalf of the legislators and those who enforce the law. Um, when you take a look at the, for the state of Michigan being a voter initiative. Uh, there's no purer way to get a <clears throat> bill or legislation passed than through the voter initiative. It is the true you know, right. feelings and words of, of the community. And so when we go out of our way to overwhelmingly vote for cannabis to be legitimized, both for medicine and adult use here, I think that it's gotta have a direct, direct correlation with laws that will then be impacted by the allowance of that, which we haven't openly done here in Michigan either. And so it's unfortunate that you have these conflicting laws, some of which are driven by our legislators, supposedly for our, our best interest, and, and some that are directly driven by us, which is certainly the, the voice of the people. And so again, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think we have to continue to write our legislators and let them know that we do find conflict in the law and that we do need state protections so that once achieved, we can drive some federal protections. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a goofy thing in Michigan. If you look at the way that you have to answer either of the forms, whether it's your medical marijuana privileges or it's your, your purchasing of a permit to purchase a pistol, uh, we, we know you can have a long gun here and you don't have to have any documentation for that. So it, it really is only applicable to us when we want to have a concealed pistol license or a CCW. Right. And uh, one of the forms does not ask and the other does. So uh, some of the workaround that people in this state have used is uh, the sequence in which you do things. So you do this one first where you're not lying on a federal form and then that one. But at the <clears> end of the day, it boils down to I'm driving down the road to a family function or to meet you at the lake and I've got my kids and wife in the car and I get pulled over with my medicine and with, with my pistol, you know, and now I have to deal with that. And yeah. certainly we don't want to be prosecuted in, in facing one of these mandatory minimums or even just facing some any form of prosecution when I'm just using my constitutional rights to do both. So I, I think that there is a lot of room that we have to travel there yet to get everybody on the same page. And it's unfortunate. Um, so again, the only way that I can see getting any of it done is co contacting your local legislators, your state legislators, and letting them know that if you're in a state that does have conflicting laws, that it needs to be recognized and dealt with as promptly as we can. Uh, you know, maybe writing of, to the NRA who loves to support, but it's a sticky situation. I, in fact, have done that. Uh, they don't want to condone the use of cannabis right now as they still feel that they're under attack. And uh, with the current political regime wanting to further reduce you know, gun laws and make them more restrictive, uh, they don't want to go out on a limb and be targeted by saying, hey, we want to promote you know, cannabis and firearms. So we have to find other ways of doing that. And uh, we've you know, done things like run ads on uh, our own little platforms. And if anybody's well to do, you can pick up a, an ad to promote in one of your local newspapers. So uh, education is key. It is. Yeah. We went out there, uh, we filmed uh, a massive facility uh, for a Can of Cribs episode. Um, I was super impressed. Every single corner we turned, there was an even bigger room, uh, a super talented team that you're working with, top technology, state-of-the-art facility. How did this all begin? You know, we, we came in, uh, you know, several years down the road once you were up and running, um, or maybe not several, but a couple years in, you had, you know, a polished uh, operation. Uh, but what was the beginning? What was the origin of Pincana? 
So the history and the story of Pincana is that uh, early on in the medical Michigan medical marijuana market, one of the founders, Matt, uh, who's also my brother-in-law and myself, uh, we looked to open up a dispensary uh, as soon as we could, shortly after the passing of the act. And it took us a couple of years to find a municipality that would allow us to do that. We ended up opening up uh, in Allen Park, Michigan. We were seventh provisioning center to open in the state and uh, we operated there for a little over a year. But in doing so, uh, High Times came into the state of Michigan. It was the first official High Times Cup that Michigan got to enjoy. And although not the New England Journal of Medicine, it was a medical cup. And we entered a strain that I'd been using for medicine for several years and wasn't able to test in the laboratory. So I suffered a back injury uh, 20 years ago and in trying to get away from opiates, already being a cannabis user, mm -hmm. just smoking a joint wasn't getting me the relief that I needed. So talking with my doctor, he suggested I get onto heavier opiates like Demerol or morphine or Oxy versus the hydrocodone yeah. that I was taking. And I said, no, that's not for me. So I went to a naturopathy. He started talking to me about cannabis. I said, hey doc, I'm not gonna lie to you, I use it. It's not helping my back pain like I need. Maybe I'll forget about it for a few minutes or it'll subside slightly, but I need something more than that. So he asked me about what, what am I using? I said, weed. He says, so no, do you know about CBD? Do you know about cannabinoids? Do you know about any of these things? And I said, no, actually I, I felt very ignorant because weed was so important to me. Cannabis was so important to me that even as a young kid, once I bought that dirt bike, there was a party store down from the trails we rode on. Me and my buddies would go down there and he'd let us buy Playboys and things. Well, <laughs> I'd be buying high times when my buddies are buying Playboys. <laughs> and so I've always been into cannabis like that, but now we're looking at, you know, at trying to, you know, I loved High Times Magazine and we're trying to get into this contest and there was no way for us to test the cannabis we had other than, you know, hold it. Am I getting high? The no. Are my back R &D. spasms going away? Yeah. Okay. I think this is CBD. So we'd put it aside. Well, lo and behold, uh, one of the strains that I had indeed had some CBD and it ended up winning the High Times Cup in 2011 for the strongest CBD content ever tested in a cannabis flower at 22.5% with 1% THC. So we were, we were elated to find out that that's what we had. And just before the event, one of the first testing labs in the state came to be, and we had sent some stuff out. So right before we actually had the cup, we knew that we had something very high in CBD. Uh, we just didn't know if it would test co concurrently like that. And indeed it did. So- um, What was after, that cultivar? What was the name of so it? So it's, it's, a, it's a canatonic derivative. Canatonic. It, canatonic X. Before canatonic existed, I had reached out to uh, Jamie at Resin Seeds before Resin was really running and certainly before CBD crew had been created. And he was kind enough to send me some genetics. So I had been vetting through those. And after we found that and gave them their props for that and didn't just rename it something and call it our own, they were very appreciative and we became some of the very first U.S. testers for CBD crews uh, future projects. And, and we went on to test many things for them. So uh, it, it is a can canatonic cultivar. Uh, and you know, even in that same pack of seeds, I had another keeper I kept to the side that I knew at THC in it. It was a 24% THC, less than 1% CBD. So there was a vast array of different uh, uh, cannabinoid profiles within that, that same pack of seeds. So from there, uh, we began to get a, a huge outpouring of people looking for non-psychoactive or low, low psychoactive uh, oils. And we began a pediatric program that we built into the largest of its kind in Michigan, treating over 50 kids here. And in doing that, we needed to find people, at the time we were only permitted 72 plants, so we had to find people that we could trust with our genetics mm. and also looking for uh, very rare things that we may find you know, use for in breeding projects. So we had talked with several of the people that were bringing materials to us and furnishing us with stuff for the shelves. 
that we implemented a mandatory testing protocol that everybody that brought things to the, the dispensary had to have it tested. We'd issue a voucher, put your stuff in the vault. When it came back tested and clean, we would then put it on the shelf and redeem your voucher. So in doing that, we knew who had clean material in the area. We knew who took pride in their stuff, who had very rare genetics. And so we invited a handful of people in and asked them if you'd be interested in helping us out with this program, so on and so forth. And we, we ended up with a four or five more people that were interested. Ultimately, that was not enough to keep up with the demand. And so we invited 26 people in, uh, ended up with 10 of them, and we ultimately coined that radical genetics. So we had 10 individuals who all had some world-class genetics, had some been growing for 20 and 30 years, and, and most for at least five or 10. Uh, collectively now, we have over 120 years of cultivation experience with cannabis under the group's belt. And that led to recognition with uh, additional wins with High Times Magazine. So I we've bet. now got over 50 or 54 uh, Cannabis Cup wins. And so people began to, to confide in us from the community about genetics, about testing, about uh, profiles and things. And so later on, uh, 2013, we had a gentleman come to us who operated certification facilities saying, I have some pediatric uh, parents coming in wanting to get treatment for their children. We will certify them here in the state of Michigan. A child under the age of 18 requires two doctor certifications. So that clinic would provide one and then we would look to the specialist or the practitioner to do the other. And so Steve, who is now one of our partners and founding members of Pincana, uh, was this owner of the certification facility. So I met Steve uh, and Matt and I began taking care of any of the children that would come through that certification clinic. Um, so for about a year and a half that went on. And then one day Steve says, hey, I've got some friends of mine that uh, have a son that's looking to get into the caregiver space. And I'm wondering if you guys would like to partner up with them to help uh, consult with them and do a 72 plant build out. So uh, we went to talk with that individual and family and uh, things sounded good. Well, simultaneously, we were interviewing with a couple of large groups, which later went on to become Highlight Farms here and Loom here uh, in Michigan to be their cultivators and uh, operators or partners. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't find a good fit there. Well, simultaneously, I was discussing with what became our uh, couple other partners, Rob and Marty, uh, the potential for doing a build out and operating a 72 plant caregiver grow with, with Rob's son, Johnny. So while we were beginning to, to embark on that and looking at buying buildings and getting them going, we were also lobbying through the National Patients' Rights Association here in Michigan to get some legislation to protect us for the use of oils, the use of concentrates, extracts, seeds, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Our voter initiative did really not pushing have the any, envelope. Yeah, did not have the verbiage of any of those things. There was no concentrates, there was no extracts, there was no uh, hash or, or, or resin to be spoke of. And therefore our attorney general uh, interpreted those things as being illegal, even mm. though we had a pediatric program. Byproduct, yeah. You know, the, certainly the voters of the state didn't vote to have the six month old smoking nine cannabis cigarettes to get the cannabinoids required for treatment. But this jackass decided that that was his interpretation. <laughs> so we had to lobby and we had to build legislation to get the privileges that we now have. So while we were simultaneously attempting to do that, we were trying to do this purchase and build out for right. Johnny. And uh, fortunately, while we were doing that and just before we bought a building, we got the legislation passed and out of the committee and into the House and Senate floors. Uh, it was st stuck in a judiciary committee for the better part of a year. And so we took nine of the patients that we had, six pediatric children uh, with parents, service dogs, and then some PTSD victims. And uh, through those testimonies, People were just weeping in the crowd. The I bet. panel were just bawling their eyes out when they can heard you these. give me can you give me one of those stories that moved you maybe the most that just every day when you were were going into that garden, you're like, This is why I'm doing it. This is who I'm doing it for. Absolutely. So um, we had uh, a mother and, and daughter who uh, from 
birth, the, the daughter was plagued with a genetic abnormality, which led to five or six different conditions. And so for the first few years of her life, she was in speech class and she made no attempt at all to communicate. And uh, her name is Marley and her mother's name is Belinda. And she, the mother used to work for the Court of Appeals. Um, her and her husband ended up, you know, separating due to the uh, stress of life compounded mm. with special needs and being deprived of uh, or, or the, finding anything that would work for their child. So one of the abnormalities that she suffered from was seizure disorders. And so when we met her, they were looking for some form of relief to the seizures. Uh, it was just by blessing that cannabis works in a plethora of ways and, and, and helps her in other ways as well. But uh, we began to treat her when she was 11 years old. She had been out of speech therapy for many years. She had uh, no ability to communicate. And after the cannabis treatment began, she began trying to use her hands and uh, mm. do what her mom felt was, you know, trying to communicate and signal. Uh, so she put her back into speech class. And within months, she was developing single word vocabularies. She wow. was communicating. I mean, it was, it was just wonderful. So uh, that went on to bring her to a, a plethora of words, 30 or 40 single words, you know, maybe a dozen or more uh, two syllable words, a handful of three syllable words that she was able to uh, utilize and, and speak and communicate with. So fast forward a little bit to the time she's 13, she's now testifying in front of Randy Richard Bill and his Judiciary Committee, and she's able to stand up out of her wheelchair, blow him a kiss and say, I love you to everybody. And, and the people's hearts just melted and everybody just began sobbing. And to see a girl who could not enjoy any kind of communication with her family, loved ones, friends, uh, and, and finally get quality of life. Have a voice. To, to have a voice, absolutely. Uh, it is just miraculous. It's God sense and, uh, and, and it's, it's the reason the power of this plant. we do what we do. And it, and it certainly is the power of this plant. So um, to increase quality of life for anybody, much less children and, and families who have had to go down such the rocky road of, of special needs and trying to try all pharmaceuticals to no avail, going to various countries to try different treatments to no avail. Uh, it's, it's, it's really powerful and it's, it's really a godsend. So um, that's just one of the many. And our first pediatric child, Cooper, uh, he was having upwards of 45 seizures a day. He was kicked out of the public school system. Uh, they just couldn't deal with it. The ambulance was at the school they every day. They gave up day. on him. And they definitely gave up on him, sent him home. Uh, his mom came to us. She had no, no other you know, choice, solution, uh, or alternative. And we began treating him with a 22 to one CBD oil. Uh, over time, we find that with most of the children, we have to tune it up a little bit, but we always err on the side of caution. We start with a 22 or a 24 to one CBD dominant uh, oil platform. And in helping him, he went from 45 seizures a day to maybe one a month. He was banned from the public schools. He was banned from being able to enjoy a pool. He couldn't take a shower as he's going through puberty without his mom standing on the other side of the curtain because the sensory overloads from the shower or from warm water would cause a seizure almost every time. So imagine, you know, being a young adult, a young man, and you know, you can't even, you know, be naked in the shower by yourself without having to have a chaperone. Uh, so life-changing, totally life-changing to take a child from 45 seizures a day to one a month. And um, it's kind of uh, weird and, and a little, little comical that uh, his service dog, who is uh, epileptic as well and was paired to him for that reason, um, hmm. we began Because to, of empathy? Because the dog would understand what he's going well, through? We began to treat the dog with CBD oil, just straight CBD oil, and the dog began to improve on seizures. Oh my and the gosh. one the one day of the month that Cooper would typically have a seizure would be related directly to lunar behavior, a full moon or something going on, uh, astrology really? driven. Yeah. And so uh, I'm sorry, astronomy driven. So um, the dog also would be having a seizure on that day. And it may not be at the same time. I want to say probably was so really at the same time. You're saying there's causation between 
a lunar uh, situation and someone's physical health having a seizure. Yes. Yep. We see it more than one child. Um, so we, we, we don't know why yet. We don't know if it's, you know, gravitational, uh, magnetic I've never type heard of that in influence. my life. I know it's crazy. And then to see the dog have the same situation on the same day, it, it just further supports that there's something linked uh, to that. So and we, we can predict when is it a full moon event? Is it a special? It's, yeah, no, it's typically a full moon event. And it's not every full moon, but it has happened more times than not. So there are preventative health measures we can take because we can predict when there's going to be a, the next full moon, right? Yeah, absolutely. We double or triple their medication dose for the day leading oh my to the gosh. day. Oh, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's, this it's, is profound. I mean, I, is. I feel like I'm hearing, well, I am hearing something for the first time. Yeah. So, and these are the things that we experienced for the first time that we never expected to. I mean, if you would have told me that without me actually, you know, seeing it, I would have thought, uh, not only is it kind of crazy hogwash that you're, maybe you're off somewhere on the moon, but um, no, I mean, it, undisputably this goes on. So there, there's things that, you know, people have to continue to look into to see how that's incredible. That's um, but yeah, so, I mean, we've had, I mean, I can go on and on with the amount of just pediatric yeah. success stories that we have. And certainly it's not a full cure miracle, but to bring that much more quality of life to somebody is miraculous in its own right. Um, right. So, uh, you know, to, to go back to how the Pincana story, you know, has gotten to where it is today, uh, we continued to work with Steve on uh, certifications and, and dosing and providing to these children. And then we were talking with Marty and Rob. Marty mm -hmm. was working as Rob's family attorney. making. And sure I worked that, with Marty to get yeah. the production agreement signed for us to go out there to film. Uh, the most thorough attorney I've ever worked with uh, <laughs> in Canna Cribs history. I, I can believe that. He's <laughs> extremely thorough. He's extremely good at what he does. And so he was there to make sure that the uh, family was hearing things that were legal and made sense. And uh, so we forged a friendship with Marty simultaneously as, as while well we were doing so with Rob. And by the time we were able to get this legislation uh, backed and get a lot of people to start pushing for it and then get these testimonials established and help to get the bills out of uh, the Judiciary Committee, uh, we really started picking up steam and hoped that it was going to pass House and Senate, which it did mm. in the coming months. So then we backed away from a 72 plant grow and said, hey, there, there's a lot of opportunity here. Fortunately, you had the uh, foresight to see around the corner that something's going to pass here and you could build something much bigger than a 72 plant medical grow, caregiver grow. Yeah, and, and not only did we want to, we felt like we had the obligation to because of the success stories that we were seeing. You had a responsibility and, to, that's right. to serve even more people. The lack of, of go-tos here in the state at the time, uh, we said, hey, we do have a responsibility to, to bring this to, to the masses. And so we built an oil platform we call Cannabiotics with an X. And an that oil became, platform? Yeah, so, so basically we have a foundational group of a couple of oils that we blend. And those are the platforms that we run if it's a seizure condition or if it's a cancer condition. And back then we thought that we would continue breeding to find maybe a plant that is going to be the cure for cancer or is going to help immensely with ALS or the onset of Alzheimer's. And we've since learned that that's probably not the proper approach. And we've, we've okay. then turned the corner again. And it lies within everybody's human genome. And pairing that with the appropriate cannabinoid profile for the condition that you have within your genome. So it's individualized. So it's very individualized. And we can talk about that a little bit more, you know, in a few minutes. I, I want to uh, get wrapped up with totally. how we got Pink Hanna to where we are right now. And so... Um, once we saw that we were around that corner, uh, fortunately, Johnny's dad, Rob, um, it has been a very successful business owner, one, owned one of the largest uh, or the largest flooring cover manufacturer in the United States at one time. And so had a lot of retail experience and had a lot of friends that um, have done very successful business ventures themselves. Mm -hmm. So they had the wherewithal to support the vision and we began, you know, putting together Pincana. It took us about two years to complete from the idea of conception 
to the, the money raise in the design stage and sticking a shovel in the ground. So in that two year period- It's a lot of patience. We, oh, it was, and, it, and it's a lot of planning and it's a lot of you know back and forth with different municipalities and working ordinances and trying to find people that support your common vision and then getting it to fruition and actually getting the facilities built after the design and, and, the, and the vision is there. So uh, starting in 2014, we started uh, the design, the plan, the vision. By 2016, uh, we were getting it all onto paper. And then uh, in 2017, we came up to Pinconning, who were one of the very first, well, they were the first township in the state to say they were gonna have an industrial green zone. Uh, so that was uh, very attractive to us. Although it's a couple uh, hours north of you know where we're from, uh, we made the drive up. We started speaking with the, the municipality, and they said, "Oh yeah, we, we want to really set the the bar for what you know these green spaces should be and be friendly with our legislation." Uh, so we began helping them uh, in suggesting what the ordinance should look like, how many areas they should allow it in, uh, and they've been open ever since. So. Um, we actually backed away from them as more communities downstate started to act as if they were going to come online and uh, went to the more populated areas. Well, not only financially is it more expensive to go to a developed totally. area, but you're dealing with smell nuisances that could be a problem with you know neighborhoods close by. So we looked at going next to the garbage dump. We figured, hey, if people are <laughs> not complaining about garbage, uh, you know they won't complain about us. And it just Brilliant. A, after you know planning for a couple of months in in an area near Canton, Michigan, uh, where they have a garbage dump in in Van Buren Township, uh, it just it wasn't financially worth doing there. They were going to limit us on no processing. They were going to limit us on not allowing a dispensary or provisioning center, and it wasn't worth uh, pursuing. So we we then backed away. It now been three or four months since we were up here in Pinconning. Uh, talking with them and we came back to revisit it and ultimately we we became uh Pinconning home for me for for Pincana and that's how the the name came to be is uh, if we're going to do cannabis and we're going to do it in Pinconning uh we we went around and around with various names we decided uh we wanted something with cannabis in it so that it did kind of speak to what we do uh I know a lot of what people are doing now is trying to stay away from having cannabis in the name or green in their color uh, to not be so stereotypical, but we wanted it to be very easy to understand and, and state, you know, what it is that we do and where we do it at. So Pincana came to be, and uh, in 2018, we broke ground, and uh, we initially put up a group of three hoop houses here um, during the build out of the main building and for the processing facility. And then about a year and a half after that, we opened up the, the main facility and got fully licensed. So we now have uh, the privileges of over 17,500 plants. Uh, we have 184 acre campus and Pincana is now thriving and, and yes. happy to be in Pincani. And so what that's was, kind of the story. That's excellent. What was the total investment into the building that you're currently in and everything included? Uh, for that build out to so, put a put a perspective on it for listeners around the world. Sure, this is a forty million dollar facility that we've built here. Um, it's just in Pinconning, and we're currently employing about one hundred and forty five people. Wow, we're one of the largest employers in the county, and uh, we're happy to be here. Yeah, that is incredible. Uh, we're going to take our first break, Dave, and when we get back, we're really going to dive into the genetics behind Radical Genetics and Pinkana. Awesome. Let's learn a little bit more about MIST by FOOP. MIST shortcuts the root system to swiftly deliver critical nutrients and minerals through your plant leaves, allowing your sick plants to heal quickly and your healthy plants to thrive. It immediately delivers everything from nitrogen, kelp, calcium, magnesium, silica, microbes, aloe vera, organic rooting hormone, I'm out of fingers to count here, and other micronutrients to plants through their leaves to promote photosynthesis. But wait, there's more. Foop offers more than just this awesome foliar spray, including a full line of organic nutrients, plant sweetener, 
cloning gel, and growing accessories like liquid nutrient syringes and pH adjusters. If you want to support the Canna Cribs podcast, head on over to foopcanna.com and use code CANACRIBS for 15% off your order or click the link in the description below. All right, Dave, we're back from our first break here and the name is Radical Genetics. I know you have put a lot of time and energy and focus um, on finding those genetics. So I'm curious, you're currently running ChemDog, Canarado, Tekken alum, who we actually filmed their facility as well. Um, what's the difference between Radical Genetics and these other breeders that you're working with? Sure, so I think first of all, most of those breeders, with the exception of uh, Tikkun Alam, uh, are individual breeders, uh, or they are people who were blessed to discover some genetics on their own and went on to further breed off of those. Um, but it was done in a confined, you know, independent fashion for years. Now they're, you know, well known and out doing, you know, a multitude of projects with all kinds of collaborations. But for us, it's really starting with the eight people that we have within Radical. It's pretty rare that you'll find a genetics company that's as robust with numbers of people than we are. And with that comes all of the different experiences, not only where you, they've been, how long they've been doing what they've been doing, but their own personal touches and, and desires. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I like things that are very gassy while some of the other guys think other guys like things that are very fruity or very dessert driven. And so having a diversity of seven or eight people doing breeding at any given time, collecting genetics leading up to our conception at Radical was very valuable for us. And I think that helps to separate us from, from different people that we've all had our own little seed libraries. Some of us were larger, much larger than others, but each of us had at least a hundred different seeds uh, or strains or cultivars in our in our little vaults in our safes and uh, you know I myself had over a thousand I had been collecting seeds for 30 years uh, I mean again I had a very hard time even as a child buying a bag finding seeds in it that I knew I paid for and then throwing them out so I used to it just was, yeah you all you those. understood the value of it and I know oh, yeah. um, through mutual friends uh, Brett Scarberry shout out to him. Um, I believe he said you have a lot of African land races as well. Yeah, so, you know, Brett has a good seed collection. He's been building out for a little while now, but I think I was the inspiration for him when I, uh, you know, started talking with him and showing him what I had. Yeah. And so, and, you know, shout out to Brett. He's an excellent friend of mine and, and, and great person and, and cultivator himself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have been blessed in a couple of fashions. Uh, I found some old African seeds you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, I just was told that they were African. And from the person that I got them from, uh, he was a pretty worldly traveler. And I knew that he had been to Africa, several countries in Africa, regions in Africa. So I had no reason not to believe that. But then uh, down the road, you know, we had the blessing of getting uh, some stuff gifted to us. So uh, there was some people collecting a lot of different uh African strains. And so Afropip was one of the go-to hmm. seed uh, companies that you could get African seed land races from. Well, when he unfortunately passed away and when he did, he left some to us uh, for us to preserve and breed off of. So we were blessed to get some Malawi, Malawi golds, some uh, of the original Durbans. Uh, we have some Kilimanjaro that's uh, also known as the original elephant stomper. Uh, which has been now bred into a lot of other things, very psychoactive uh, sativa, uh, some Swazi gold. Um, we've got some red Cong Congolese, uh, which is, you know, like a super fruity uh, land race for African. They're not so much known for that. Um, other things, uh, I, man, I, you got me on the spot. I can't think of, of it's all, all good. Of you you but, named a lot. I mean, and your your collection is pooled with the other uh, seven breeders that make up radical genetics. So I'm sure you guys have an extremely impressive uh, catalog and seed bank uh, together. We do. And the biggest problem about it is finding the time to get into it and dive through and, and vet and study and 
and see what's really there. And of course, then as the clock goes by ticking, you know that the viability and the germination rates are gonna continue to lessen and dwindle. Mm -hmm. So we know there's a clock ticking now. So thank the good Lord, we have a facility of this size. We have two really nice R&D rooms set up strictly for vetting and seed hunting uh, through through our genetic library. And so we'll pick things that we have intentions to, to use them in one fashion or another, and then start uh, testing them in the R&D room to see if they actually germinate, if they come out to be what we expect them to be, and then how we can plug them into some of the up and coming projects. Right, and with such a, a vast genetic library, you still wanted to go out and establish partnerships with ChemDog, Canarado, and Tikkun alum. Yeah, well, so Kevin and Greg, um, and some of the guys over at Tacoon, uh, they're all really good people. They all love cannabis. So, you know, that's the thing that we have in common. These aren't people who got into it just for the money in the last decade, uh, you know, paired with corporate cannabis just to try to make a dollar. These are people who have been from the trenches, grass rooted, living and dying cannabis since young ages like myself. And so having that common denominator amongst us uh, helped us to build friendships. And then looking at some of the world-class things that they have, yeah, we, we have a phenomenal genetic library, but they have proven things that are already sought after. And 30 years plus of research. You know that. So uh, it's, it's hard to turn down some extended offers and opportunities. Uh, and then we felt like, hey, we'd want to do our friends a solid and get their brands to be recognized for the quality that they carry here in Michigan. Uh, there wasn't a lot of Canarado stuff going on, uh, you know, when we began the design phase here. And so as Kevin's work just tail off to always have the new new and always have the, the, the latest and greatest and fruities and funds and desserts and, and then some gases and, and legend, you know, lines that he's just recently ran. Uh, it, it was a good opportunity to enhance our library and, and to find solid partners that we could help to build our brands with. Um, and, you know, we look to eventually get outside of the state of Michigan. And so we want things that are recognized nationally and things that do have 30 years of, of proven track record behind them. So it was a no brainer for us uh, when we started, you know, feeling that chemistry as we got closer and closer to licensing. And we're very happy that we have forged the relationships that we have with them. So Radical Genetics is a brand, it's a team, it's a, a genetic library, um, but it's more than that. It's, it's almost a movement uh, to heal the world, would you say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So all of us have that drive in us. We've been in this for so long. We've exposed ourselves to vulnerabilities of not only ridicule, but prosecution, family members that don't want anything to do with you. Uh, and, and we still stayed that course and that way of life because it's what we love. It's what we believe in. It's what we know. And now it's what we use to give back to the goodness of humanity. I mean, it's it's what we feel God's blessed us with the talents to do. And so, yes, it is a movement. It is a way of life for us. Um, and it's a blessing for us. And for us to have met one another and to work as cohesively and intertwined in, as we do, it's it's phenomenal. Um, and so we've been able to, to do things like the Cannabis Cups and get in front of tens of thousands of people and, and forge relationships with them, which we can now share genetics with, we can share dosing information with, we can share cultivating information with. You know, we were just down in Lansing here. We had a caregiver rally. Unfortunately, there's some of the corporate giants here in the state now that are looking to ban the current caregiver market forcing people to have to so they think it will force people to have to go into their shops and that's bullshit and we don't believe in it and so we as radical and we as pencana uh the whole teams went down to the rally in at the state capitol on the steps and said hey we we don't believe in this we won't stand for this uh because it is a way of life for us. And we believe it's the right of every American and every human being to cultivate their own medicine instead of having to purchase it from big pharma. But uh, it is a way of life. I mean, in meeting people like Brett and in meeting guys like yourselves and your whole crew, I mean, we look to, to be able to reflect on that and continue to build these relationships for the rest of our lives. And in doing so, we directly and indirectly impact all of the people around us. 
oh, you know him? And now, boom, I'm talking to them mm-hmm. about a hemp farm or I'm talking to them about hempcrete. And they're going to bring in a, a new you know, means of doing construction here in the state. So it continues to get deeper and deeper as a movement, not just an occupation, not just something that you do sitting on your couch or throwing a Frisbee at the park. But this is your it life is, legacy. It, it, it's, a, it's a life legacy. It's a way of life. And, it's, and yeah. we wouldn't have it any other way. So for, for the radical guys, uh, I mean, they've all relocated up here two hours away because this is, this is what we believe in. This is what mm-hmm. we live in and breathe. So uh, it is a movement. It's bigger than a company. It's a lifestyle for ourselves, our family members, and, and everybody that we encounter. How can the rest of the world benefit from radical genetics? So I think that first and foremost, it's to, you know, try to, few of our cultivars and see what you think of some of our hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, Take a look at what our genetic library and the ability that we have to house all of these things uh, can play a role in impacting other people's lives in a beneficial manner. Now that we've finally shaken the propaganda and the stigma in a lot of these states and gotten states' rights, we hope to be able to get you know seeds out to uh, any and everybody that wants to try them starting in the very near future. Uh, oh, so wow. We've got a partner with some people that we can trust that will continue to do good things with uh, seed vending. But um, right now, so we're coming do- soon, you might be able to buy radical genetic seeds around Absolutely. the world pending for, for now, logistics it's be, and legislation. That's and right. Stuff like now that. it's going to be in Michigan. Uh, but soon enough, we hope the federal government will will allow not only banking, but for us to enter inter- yeah. traffic. Safe you know, Banking Act. and Through, through state-to-state uh, behavior, and then, then we can certainly get seeds out to the masses. But for now, in the coming months here, we're going to be releasing some seeds to all the provisioning centers in Michigan, and people will be able to, to, to roll in anywhere and pick up what we've got. So you don't find seeds very frequently in a lot of these dispensaries because, again, they're ran by corporate giants who don't want you growing yourself. But we don't partner with them. We don't believe in that way of, of thinking. And so anybody that'll have our seeds, which they'll be allowed to vend, we're going to look to to place in these dispensaries. So coming soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And I know that you have a, a pretty extensive background in pheno hunting. What does it look like these days? You know, you're, you're running a commercial facility. You have these uh, testing rooms that you were talking about. What's a typical pheno hunt look like for you and your team? So it can go a few different ways. If we're trying to, you know, streamline something and get it, you know, out sooner than later, because as a lot of cannabis cultivators know, it could take at least two years from the idea into the the conception, picking the parents, doing the Mm -hmm. initial project, and then going through drying them, vetting them, and, and confirming that what your desired intentions are are actually what's coming out, you know, the other end. So if we look to streamline something, we may immediately do the whole punch technique, PCR it, find out if what's male and what's female and isolate the males out if we're not looking to pick a male from that. Go right down the feminine line, not necessarily feminized seeds, but through laboratory testing now, we can determine right early on through a simple hole punch in the leaf what we've got. From there, we get into the actual pheno hunts where we're looking for structure, we're looking for vigor, we're looking for how close the node spacings are in that structure. We're looking for how bushy they are. Are they going to fit properly in our technique or our style here at our facility? Are they better suited for someone who grows outdoors with massive plants? Well, if the structure says that it may be a suitable outdoor strain, now we have to get into the testing of it. We have to look for things like not only terpene profiles and macro and micro cannabinoid profiles, some very unique cannabinoid profiles. If you're doing that, you have to have a lab that's got standards that can test for said uh, rare cannabinoids. And so you, it requires us to partner with good laboratories. It requires us to do those extensive testing, which when we finally get to the flower side of it, now you have the fun and the, the reap the, you know, the, the rewards of all of your hard work and get out the sample and, and, and see what this, you know, new project is, is all about. But we look for the smells, the terpenes, the cannabinoid profiles, 
Then we look to see how vigorous something is inside and out and in what kind of lighting spectrum. Then we look to see how resilient it is. If we're going to place it outside because of the structure, it has to be mold resistant. It has yep. to be pest resistant. Especially so, in Michigan with your temperamental weathers. Oh my gosh. No kidding. Just coming off of 95 <laughs> and then 61 and then 83. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's crazy here. Uh, so we have a great place to test those both inside and out. Uh, so, so pheno hunts are always a lot of fun. Uh, they're time consuming and sometimes they're heartbreaking. You think you've selected two of the greatest things ever. They, they, they through and through show that they just don't pair well together. Right. So we're, we're hoping to see through more genomic sequencing, which we've been participating in over the last, no, I guess about five years now. We started with Mary Jean. We've used medicinal genomics. We used phylos until all the you know, oh, yeah. kind of bullshit I have a whole started interview with about that with uh, Nat from uh, Humboldt Seed Company. He kind of gave me the inside scoop on that one. Okay, so yeah, you know, it's 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 going to be a, a blessing and a curse. I mean, if, if people try to start patenting your genomes because you simply wanted to register them, that's bullshit. It's going to be a bloodbath if, if that happens. It will be, I agree. Uh, and I think they're realizing that. So the threats that we were hearing of, you know, a year ago doesn't sound like it's really going to come to fruition, but you never know. People are crazy and some human beings, you know, evil exists. So This is true. You, you get the ability to do these genomic sequences, which really gives you a leg up on breeding because you can see where these things truly come from and their initial origins. You can see what, what uh, lineages have been uh, developed off of them. And it, and it helps to kind of pull back the curtains and see, you know, firsthand the true roots of what you may be working with. And so that's helped us a little bit in some of our breeding uh, projects and, and really given us the opportunity to avoid some unnecessary things and, and get the true intentions out of what we're breeding for. What about those up and coming breeders uh, around the world um, trying? You know, what, what, what are some best practices? Um, what are some things that you've learned over the years that you could share with them today? Sure. So I think the first thing is in best practices is sterility. You got to keep your place clean. Right now, with the new pathogens, uh, bacteria, and viruses that we're finding in cannabis, whether it's the hop latent viroid, the hops mosaic virus, for every Every time I hear tobacco mosaic virus, I'm thinking more and more now that it's actually the hops mosaic virus. Okay. People really don't know what they're looking at. We're seeing a carryover from lettuce farming right now as well. And there's a lettuce viroid that's getting into cannabis and it spreads like wildfire. So the first thing you need to do is maintain sterility <clears throat> and, and keep a clean garden. If you're going to hatch seeds for yourself or for sale, you want to make sure that there are no mold spores on these seeds, that there are no russet mite eggs or things that are so microscopic that the average individual that doesn't think of these things overlooks them. So you start off with a clean slate and, and you, you know, the sky's the limit from there. Mm -hmm. It's selecting quality genetics. So don't get me wrong. Some of the very best things that we've seen in the last 30 years have been anomalies or accidentals, whether it's a chem dog 91 or it's a gorilla glue four or gorilla glue one or, or some other things that we, we commonly know about. Uh, those are, are blessings via accident. But if you're going to try to be a breeder and, and actually have intention in what you're doing, you should start off with things that you know to be very stable that, you know, through stressing them prior to putting them into your projects, that you stress test them, that you in light manipulation, heat and cold manipulation, find out if these things will remain stable when they're not in ideal environments. Because if you're going to breed, you should breed for the very best that you can. And those are one of the, the things that you'll need to establish uh, before you engage in the project and select the, the, the mother or the mothers or the mother and the father, depending on you know what it is that you're doing. If it's a reversal, if it's an S1 project, or if it's an F1 project, or whatever it is that your BX project that, that you're out to accomplish. Uh, so I think sterility, I think vetting the genetics and making sure you're dealing with stable genetics. And then I think that it is enjoying yourself while you do it. That is a That's very, key. very important ingredient in, in breeding is that if you're not having fun doing it, I'm as much of a, a religious Christian as I am a believer in karma. And I think that you know, all of that is felt in the project. And so if you don't enjoy what that you're doing. That energy is picked up with the plants. 
Amen. And uh, and it gives back that energy, you know, when you really are committed to it. Tenfold. So, uh, I mean, that is, as you mentioned earlier, what got me into enjoying just growing things in general is is getting that life back. You walk into a greenhouse and there's either nothing in there or there's maybe a hundred plants and you're looking to create 10,000 and within two months by via cutting and, and, and duplicating, replicating, now you have an entire house full of life that you are directly responsible for creating. And uh, there, there, there's therapeutic value just in that. So you need to enjoy yourself while you're doing it. Um, and then I think it can be done for the average person. If we're talking about just having some fun and, and, and doing some good things in breeding, get yourself a tent. You know, don't don't try to start off in a monstrous room because, again, I'm going to tell you 50, 60 percent of the time, those projects are not going to ultimately stand the test of time. Oh, They're yeah. not going to produce something that is is absolutely mind blowing a one. And so do it, do it in a small tent, do it in a controlled environment, start off with clean things, have fun while you're doing it, maintain sterility and uh, know that you've got things that are stable. And I think you're on the track for, for success. That is really excellent advice. And we have a growers network forum as well. Uh, we have a little over 17,000 members at the time of this recording. So join a community, you know, get, get onto an online forum where you can just ask any question in the world, I see first-time growers every single day um, posting on the Growers Network forums, just growersnetwork.org. Um, we have a very vibrant community that loves to help, um, and you'd be surprised um, how much, uh, quote-unquote, free advice you can get on the internet from people that know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing, um, and they're happy to hold your hand and get you through your first harvest. Um, and, and maybe you don't consume your first harvest. You know, It's okay to fail. Um, I think going back to that first point of having fun and seeing this as like a science experiment and not some, you know, trumped up activity, like just have some fun, have an open mind and, uh, it's okay to fail. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier, Dave, um, you mentioned in a platform, an oil platform where you're mixing different oils. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. What does that look like? Yeah, so I refer to the platform. So we have a CBD platform and we have a THC platform. And now we're looking for um, other, maybe to add another uh, platform or two that would be a CBG platform because we're seeing a lot of really good things coming from CBG for anti-anxiety. Mm. Uh, CBG and THCV both uh, collectively put into... Uh, a cartridge, we're getting excellent anti-anxiety relief from one puff. So people who would typically go into a, a large meeting area and they don't like crowds or they're going to go shopping and they don't like crowds, one puff in the car, go spend an hour, hour and a half in the grocery store. And instead of having anxiety and be worried about running into people that you don't want to see or forgetting something you're supposed to buy, people spot on. Uh, it wow. also carries over to some of these proactive uh, dosings that we speak of with the kids and with anybody. So uh, I, I mentioned Cooper being our first pediatric mm -hmm. patient. One of the things that he really enjoys doing is bowling. And unfortunately, for about eight years, once he grew into his seizure condition, he couldn't go bowling because it was one of the number one triggers wow. for his seizures. And the minute he would start to walk into the bowling alley and hear the balls hitting the pins and pins being crushed, he'd start to have a seizure. Or if it wasn't right then, it was 10 minutes into being in the bowling alley. And, and so he couldn't bowl, much like he couldn't swim and he likes to swim. So um, now with treatments, proactively can be on a bowling league, gets a CBD with a little bit of THC in it, in the car, hits a vape cartridge, goes into the bowling alley, and, and is absolutely And that little free. bit of THC is because of the entourage effect in order to uptake it. it. Could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So what we found is that any one cannabinoid on its own is not going to offer this entourage or this synergistic effect that the plant brings to humanity. So you can't just isolate one or two of these compounds. Okay. We found that it is imperative to keep the entire array of constituents that's found in the cannabis plant. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't isolate some of those and then take and select which ones may be best for your human genome or your condition and then compile them back together. So that kind of 
brings me back to the platforms. Mm -hmm. And that is what we do. We don't necessarily have a single strain anymore that we extract and that's our oil platform. We'll look to isolate a few compounds and put them back together with a full uh, spectrum of terpenes so that you can receive that entourage or that synergistic effect. And, and so much like the government trying to say there's no medicinal value in cannabis, but then per allowing the prescription drug Marinol to be prescribed for the better part of three decades now, Marinol has never, you know, rose to the top of the New England Journal of Medicine or to the PDR for its efficacy because it, it doesn't work very well. And that's because it's a single synthetic duplication of just THC. Hmm. You need to have all of these constituents present to really to drive that entourage effect. Okay. And so we have realized that and now we, we build these oils to make sure that we keep that all in one package and that people do reap the full re medical rewards of, of the cannabis plant. So going back to these cartridges or these uh, syringes of oil that people will take, the, the cartridge is nice because it, it gives an immediate, you know, uh, ah, means of dose. I was curious about that. So that's faster, your body um, uptakes that uh, full effect faster than like a tincture or syringe on the tongue? Yeah, and so some of the tinctures are now entering into the realm of sublingual, where we're having these things pass through the sublingual tissue of our mouths and getting you know some effect out of it in five minutes and full effect in fifteen to thirty minutes, depending on how true they're giving back you know the, the results of these things. But sublingual tablets passing through that transdermal you know membrane in your mouth can get you some immediate uh, or, or or almost immediate relief, but. Uh, forever, the vape cartridge inhalation is what we know cannabis to, to, to be to offer immediate onset. And so for us, the easiest way to take that oil platform and provide it in an immediate means versus a kind of a time delayed, you know, oral ingesting is by means of vaporizing it. Okay. Um, you know, cannabis cigarettes have done that for us for thousands and thousands of years, but you can't build that platform or this customized right. cocktail in a flower form. So we look to the cartridge or, or, or the, you know, vaporizer cart to do that. To a more uh, scientific approach for that holistic effect. That's right. And to get an immediate effect so that you can take it right before you go into the grocery store or right before you go bowling or, or whatever it is that you maybe you like if your husband likes to, to boat and you're a person who doesn't like to, to be around water, but you really want to support the family on the family boat. Boom. You got the vaporizer when huh. you're jumping on the boat and now you're good to go. So vape cartridges end up being a good tool for us uh, to get immediate onset. Um, so we have several platforms um, that we want to develop. We have two that we utilize now, a primarily CBD and a primarily THC, okay. and we'll start you on one or the other. So if you have cancer, uh, we're going to start you off on the THC platform immediately. And we're going to start trying to shove it in multiple holes, if you will. So uh, orally every day, three to five times a day to can keep a consistent dose. If it's something that we're trying to be aggressive with, we're going to look to use a suppository as well. What we found over the last five years of research is that when we eat it, the body processes the Delta-9 into 11-carboxy. Uh, it's, hmm. it's a different form than uh, Delta-9 or Delta-8 or, or another cannabinoid. And people can either be very hypersensitive to that or people Me. can also, yeah, <laughs> myself as well. Yeah. I mean, we, you and I can sit, we'll smoke, you know, blunts and All bongs day. till the cows come home, but you throw a hundred milligrams. Oh, our body man, I, processes I, I, it differently, you're saying. hundred percent. So we're very hypersensitive to the 11 carboxy. And so uh, in order to uh, try to get away from that and still reap the rewards of very high doses that are necessary to combat and treat cancer, we found that by rectal absorption, you do not pass through the GI tract, you avoid the stomach and the liver, and by doing so, you remain mm. in the Delta-9 form, and you only experience about 10 to 15% of the high that you would get if you ate it orally. Okay. So now if you need to uh, be able to handle 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 milligrams a day to combat cancer- You're circumventing of, uh, that process. Absolutely. And, wow. and now you can maintain some quality of life while you're in a, you know, typically it's a 60 day, 
run that you would you would engage in to try to you know see if you get any uh, necessary uh, stopping uh, in in of the cancer cell spreading in mm -hmm. cancer cell death. So uh, after 60 days, you've either got well on your way to beating it, or you're going to show that you're non-responsive. If you're non-responsive, you can change to a different um, oil platform or, or, or add some different constituents into the, the platform that you're currently using, or you can decide that this isn't working for me. I'm going to use it for more of an appetite stimulation okay. and more of a rest pain easy, relief or... and, and go back to something that's uh, considered, you know, a little bit more pharmaceutical. Um, but, you know, to each their own and everybody's genome is different. Right. So, well, again, we use two platforms when we start with the children and especially <clears throat> for seizure disorders. Uh, we find that CBD is a very good anti-seizure medication just in its own right. But when you add the constituents of cannabis, you get a much better, higher efficacy uh, than you find with it, uh, you know, on its own or only with the presence of a couple terpenes. There's a uh, product out called Epidolex now, comes from GW Pharmaceuticals. Ah, uh, yes, it rings a bell. Comes from over the pond in, in the UK. Yep. I'm very happy to see that we now have a full spectrum truly derived from cannabis extract that's in a little aerosol mouth spray. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with it is it's only one configuration or platform, if you will. If it does not work for your genome, there is no other alternative. If you want it to be prescribed and approved by the FDA and potentially covered by your insurance. They told everybody they were gonna get it covered by their insurance. Now that it's FDA approved, very few people get it covered. Um, hmm. But occasionally it is, and, and hey, I, I fully support some of our parents uh, of the children that we treat using it to help offset some of the costs <clears throat> of other things if their insurance company will cover it, which we do have a couple that, that do. But we have yet to find any of the children to be able to just go on to Epidolex on its own and get the same results as they get with the oils that we're providing. So if they go to Epidolex, it ends up being the Epidolex used in conjunction mm -hmm. with one of the platforms that we give them. Multi-pronged approach. Absolutely. And so uh, what we do is we'll start off with the general platform on a very light dose. We double that dose every two weeks until we start to uh, enter into the sweet spot, if you will, to where we're seeing a lot of relief, a lot of effectiveness. And then we plateau and we, we watch very carefully. Uh, the other thing that you do have to watch, uh, and I didn't think was the case for a while, is drug interaction. So if you're taking heightened doses, especially orally and not just smoking it, um, what we find is that it's not the cannabis that poses the issue. Specifically with uh, benzodiazepines and people who are taking those for seizure disorders, but the cannabis, when you're using it orally, gets into the liver and it somehow stops the removal of the benzos by the liver. And so what happens is we'll get these patients calling saying, I think I'm getting high. And you said that, you know, there's very low dose mm. of THC or, or other uh, psychoactive cannabinoids. What's going on? And over uh, years of research now, what we found is that they're getting uh, barbiturate um, toxicity. So in doing their blood work, it isn't the cannabinoids that are building up and making the them benzos. feel high. It's the benzos that are no longer being removed at the same rate as they are used to because they've now paired Altering that with their effect. ingesting cannabis orally. So what we've been able to do is reduce some of those benzos though. So you say, well, shit, let's start backing down on which one. When we back down on the benzos, you end up still honing in on that sweet spot, taking less of them and not experiencing that benzotoxicity. But that really needs to be done in support with your <clears> specialist <throat> so that anytime you're going to begin weaning yourself off of a prescription drug, you're, you're really you know kept a solid eye on by a medical professional. Uh, but just using cannabis is something that anybody can do at home. And uh, you know, worst case scenario, you're going to end up wanting to go to bed and feel like crap for a couple hours, wake up tomorrow, fine as wine and try something new again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the benefit of cannabis, right? Is nobody's going to die from it, uh, especially if you're you're conscious of drug interactions. Right. Um, but um, when when we look to you know getting down the road, we've been blessed to be in discussions with a group of people. They're working out of the University of Texas right now. They have a patent pending contrast dye that can be used in CT, uh, MRI. Mm, I saw that. 
and another form of imaging. So you'll do a before and after dye of your endocannabinoid system. Then you go and begin ingesting cannabinoids and go back and have it dyed and, and tested again. And you can actually the watch delta. the end. That's right. Find your, your uh, when you achieve full activation of your endocannabinoid system, finally telling you what type of platform or what type of constituents yes. and cocktail it is that's going to be best serving you. Uh, so hopefully that technology proves to be very accurate and effective and it becomes mainstream here in the next couple of years because it'll be it'll be earth shattering for I've wanted medical that. treatment. I've wanted that for a long time, like, a, you know, 23 and me for cannabis, like before 20 and me, you Absolutely. do a report. I know there's a couple companies trying to do that, but you figure out what your endocannabinoid system, uh, what matches, what works for you, what doesn't work for you as well and then somehow submitting that report to a cannabis company that can create a custom blend for you um you're running a commercial operation you know obviously you have it's not like you have tens of thousands of products that you can like different uh you know cultivars or different edibles or formulations you have a set menu right yep. but if a company can kind of crack that code where they can take a highly individualized report um, and create a custom blend cartridge, uh, that's a billion dollar company right there. Uh, we fully agree. And we look to have that in phase three of our operations here. Really? It's, it's a very specialized department uh, that you can go sit down, start off with a face-to-face -face consultation, then dive into wow. all your scientific data. And then we could offer something that would be customized specifically for that individual. Of course, we're going to have to get equipment that blends that doses that measures in very fine incremental value exactly. and you could load the machine up with 20 or 30 different cannabinoids and terpenes and be able to do 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 and yes. it's, what i think of is like the <clears throat> heat mixing machine at home exactly people, for sure with williams and a little bit of yy and yes. r1 and g2 and, and you give them that swab and they can reverse engineer it like that exactly and then now once you know what works, you just go in and get it every time. This is my number. This I is will my be code. your patient, you know, customer for life. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that that is so powerful. Um, and I think one of the final uh, variables for tipping point um, around the world, really, uh, is having a consistent dose, but a dose customized for you. Um, you achieve those two things at a, at a good price point. Um, it's uh, who can compete with that, right? Um, yeah, nobody. Yeah, and and where where do if at all um, synthetic terp terpenes and cannabinoids uh, come into play? So right now we're all about continuing research and development on synthoids synthesis. Um, but what we know from just the world abroad and 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 then into pharmaceutical manufacturing is that the the synthesizing process creates things that are not naturally occurring. They create synthoids. We do not know what all of these little synthetic markers and thin synthoids will do. We don't know if they're harmful to humans, to animals. You know, we, we have no way so of knowing. So much to learn. That's right. Until you actually go through those processes and then spend five or 10 years actually researching these man-made compounds. So we're not opposed to them here at Pincana and in Radical, um, but we want them to remain not for sale okay. for several years to come because we just don't feel like there's enough research there. And what we don't want is another reoccurrence of K2 and bath salts bullshit where people oh, say, whoa. oh, this is a great yes. synthetic thing and you'll pass your drug test and Vape blah, gate, blah, blah. cutting with vitamin E, yeah. And all of these horrific things that we've had to go through that are not naturally occurring in cannabis and are giving cannabis a bad name. So uh, I actually research... got laced with spice at a party once in college, one of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. Um, I would never uh, choose to smoke spice. Um, it was horrible. I bet, and and it's 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 it should have never been permitted. It was just a a loophole in the law. Yeah, exactly. and People exploit it, right? I mean, we're seeing that with D eight right is, now. Yes, Delta eight THC carts flying out the doors, exactly. and the DEA stopped. I think it was the Champs trade show. They stopped. They like locked the doors, right? And some booths had to you know get rid of their inventory. I mean. 
Um, we're not, I don't think the entire cannabis industry is, is taking two steps backwards, but there are some gray area. There are some loopholes that are being exploited and hurting us as a whole. Yeah, I agree. I sit on the state scientific advisory board here, uh, for the Michigan regulatory, uh, advisory board. And, um, most of the people on that board are in agreement that there's a lot of potential there in synthesizing cannabinoids, but it just is, it shouldn't be up for human consumption yet until we've got years of proof uh, and research showing that these things are helpful, non-harmful, and uh, there, there's more benefit than risk to using them. For the time being, I don't wanna see people creating cannabinoids from yeast, from LG, uh, and, and then taking that CBD, because largely the way that it works, and at least the SOP that we have uh, for research is that you would start with CBD and then you can synthesize that mm -hmm. and, and manipulate that into virtually any other cannabinoid that you want. For a while, people were only able to jump to Delta-8 or D8, as they call it. Bend it. But, but, but now you can go right to D9 with over a 90% conversion. But when you look at it, you have to use extremely volatile acids and compounds to mm -hmm. do that. So it's very dangerous to be doing to begin with. It needs to be done in a laboratory setting. And then when we try to go in and, and do a deep dive on, okay, we got 90.2% uh, D9 or Delta 9 here. What are the other things that are in here? Some yeah. of the things we can't even determine what they are yet. Uh, there's such new synth synthoids or synthetic pieces of material that we don't even know what to call them yet, much less what they do, how they'll affect us. I did how they'll get, harm us. Exactly. And I, I did get the chance. I don't know if you've seen the THCO acetate going around. No. So, what is that? Teach me about that. So THCO acetate is a byproduct of doing some of this uh, synthesizing and by doing just some some cleaning of of cannabinoids in general. You get a very small byproduct, which is uh, is the THCO acetate. What it does is it gives more of a mushroom, like body buzz okay. effect than typical Delta 9 does just by smoking it. So it's kind of more a More cerebral, blend, physical. More physical, more body feel, um, and more floaty. And it makes you kind of cerebral cloudy. Um, I didn't love it. It was a unique experience to cannabinoids for me, but then I kind of felt shitty for hours after the high oh, let off. No. And it is, it is a, like a groggy, like almost like a hangover. Oh, kind of groggy hangover and my stomach instead of feeling, I mean, cannabis makes my stomach feel really good. And if anything, I get a little hungry, I eat and I feel wonderful. <laughs> I mean, uh, this made my stomach feel a little upset, a little bit butterfly, a little bit queasy afterwards. And again, is that those, these synthesized compounds that are right. in there harming my GI tract, killing right. off your flora and your GI tract? I, I, we really don't know. So after experiencing it one time and doing some more research on it, it was given to me in a cartridge. Hey, here, try this THCO. I didn't, I didn't even know that it was synthesized. Right. Uh, but after trying it, I gave the cart back to the person that let me try it, and, and I'm good. I, I, I don't wish to use it anymore. I think we need a lot more <clears> research there. I can count on cannabis through and through not to harm me, to be nothing but beneficial mm -hmm. for me. These things you cannot. So uh, again, the synthetic terpenes, the same. Uh, they're, they're created in a little bit of a different form, but uh, we do not get nearly the effectiveness when we use a naturally you know, created botanical terpene, which I'm not opposed to. And, putting and that you're not opposed to tissue culture either. Like no, you, you're saying you can derive from tissue culture as well. Absolutely. We have a tissue culture lab here mm -hmm. and we, we love our tissue culture lab, but you have to be careful, especially when you get into doing Meristem work, because again, by using acids and hormones, you can actually alter the genome of the plant that you have. So when you do Meristeming, it is imperative that you take what you've got and right off the bat, you grow it out and confirm that it is exactly what it has always been and you expect it to be. And if you want to really do good things in the in the cannabis meristemming space, then you should send it out for a genomic sequence to make sure that it hasn't been altered at all. And it pairs directly over top of that plant before or prior to, uh, you know, meristemming or, or, or very and what, deep dive. What is uh, meristemming? I actually haven't heard of that before. Okay, so the meristemming is taking um, the, the, the tiniest of the top uh, 
piece of tissue from any nodal piece. So it, it, take any of your top shoots. Uh -huh. It doesn't necessarily have to be a terminal, sh you know, primary shoot, but you come off of any of the top shoots of the plant, the newest growth of the plant. Okay. And when you peel back the few layers that are inside there, you'll get to the meristem, which is the atypical top piece of that newest growth. And most of the time, it has not been fully engaged with the vascular system of the plant yet. So the vascular system of the plant comes up to a point, mm -hmm. and then just above that is those newest cellular conglomerate growths. And if you surgically remove those, you hope to A, get them prior to tapping fully into the vascular system where they may have fallen victim to any of the contaminants that are living within the plant. And then once you have that, it is oftentimes a blank um, canvas uh, or a non-programmed group of cells. So this is where the manipulation can come into play. If you have it and it is non-programmed yet and you put hormones on it that manipulate it to do something other than what it was born to do you may now have a genetically modified organism mm. and we are not in the business of making gmo cannabis okay so it, again it is very imperative that you be a responsible um you know cultivator and operator and you know what you're looking at you know what you started with and then you confirm that before you put that back out into you know massive production that it is confirmed to be exactly as it was before you started just void of any you know unwanted pathogens uh right. bacteria viruses bugs etc okay Thank you for explaining that. We're going to take a quick break here, Dave. And when we get back, we're going to talk about some of the most exciting cannabinoid research that you're currently doing at Pinkana and Radical. Awesome. We look forward to it. Let's learn a little bit more about MIST by FOOP. MIST shortcuts the root system to swiftly deliver critical nutrients and minerals through your plant leaves, allowing your sick plants to heal quickly and your healthy plants to thrive. It immediately delivers everything from nitrogen, kelp, calcium, magnesium, silica, microbes, aloe vera, organic rooting hormone, I'm out of fingers to count here, and other micronutrients to plants through their leaves to promote photosynthesis. But wait, there's more. Foop offers more than just this awesome foliar spray, including a full line of organic nutrients, plant sweetener, cloning gel, and growing accessories like liquid nutrient syringes and pH adjusters. If you want to support the Canacribs podcast, head on over to foopcana.com and use code Canacribs for 15% off your order or click the link in the description below. All right, Dave, so we're back from uh, our second break. And I know that you have a lot of research going on um, on both genetics, but all the different cannabinoids as well. So what are you most excited about right now in your current research? Uh, I, I'll say uh, the same thing I was referring to earlier with the CBG and the THCV mm -hmm. in one form. Uh, we've got a couple of different terpene profiles that we like to add to that. And one is causing most people to be a little sleepier and one causes most people to be a little bit more mentally alert and, and driven. Right. Um, so we have a morning and a night one, but it's again for that anti-anxiety. And so many people suffer from anxiety these days on, a, on either a, a small scale or a grand scale. And the more people that become open to discussing these things, they come to us, hey, I, I, you know, you are medicinal, you guys are medically driven, We, mm -hmm. I want to be truthful with you, I'm on Paxil, or I'm on Prozac, or I'm on this or that, and I, and I supplement with Xanax because of my anxiety, and I just want to make sure, A, there's no interaction, and B, that you have something that might do the same thing. And obviously, you know, we, we have all kinds of things in the world of cannabis, but Having the ability to deal with a general group of people's anxiety, I think would be a super grand slam uh, for the cannabis industry. And so we're working on one that, that's showing a lot of promise uh, with people who suffer from severe anxiety. And we wanna make sure that it, it, it works well on a good broad you know, platform. Um, so we, we like those things. I use that word frequently about platform because it, it's a, a nice it truly flat, is 
open yeah. space that you can start building from. Mm -hmm. And um, and and so that's what I, I think uh, is going to be our next big thing. And I'm excited about that. And then um, for conditions outside of anxiety, cannabinoids, the easiest one for us, the one that is indisputable is epilepsy and other seizure driven disorders uh, and CBD with some presence of other right, cannabinoids. Right, that entourage we were talking about. Exactly, and what we really like is a little bit of CBC. We don't really know hmm. why yet. We just know that when it isn't always present, we don't get 100% effectiveness, which when I say 100% effectiveness, we'll see some improvement in seizure uh, conditions with almost every single person with a seizure condition that we give CBD with some other cannabinoid presence and terpene presence there. If you do just an isolate, you don't get the same results. So if you're going online and buying hemp derived CBD with three added terpenes, you're not going to get what I'm speaking of all the time. Now there are people who do. So simple CBD in its own right works for them. That's not that often. Um, almost always, it, especially after a week or two of using it, you're going to have to have the presence of these other things to experience that entourage effect. But uh, CBD with epilepsy, I mean, the children can't fake seizures. Uh, infants can't fake seizures. When they're on you know, the maximum amount of, of barbiturates that they're, the nine month old is permitted or the three year old is permitted and the parents come and say, hey, can we do anything? Uh, you start administering micro doses of oil and the seizures stop. I mean, there, there's just no disputing that. And it happens in the hospital, it happens at home. Um, so for that, we have gotten a lot of respect from doctors who have now perked their interest because before that, eh, yeah, sure, your back hurt. Now it doesn't. Sure, buddy. Uh, you know, <laughs> let me cut you. Um, so those are the two cannabinoid um, groups that I'm I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to now. But we're starting to find so many more micro cannabinoids, as I was, I was mentioning. Uh, we need to find labs which are hard to find that can get these standards. And then sometimes the standard has to be homemade because they simply there's none to be purchased. So if you know that a certain strain, when you look at it, has some things here that are they're terpene ish, but we, we don't have anything to really say this is what it is. You have to start to get enough of it to do more work. Mm -hmm. And um, those are the things that we're looking forward to is utilizing, you know, a larger plant count to have some more we can peel off for R and D and and really hunt for some of these very rare micro cannabinoids. But CBN, uh, we're doing a, a product here in Michigan with Darren McCarty that's uh, high in CBN, both for an edible and then we'll probably do a cartridge after that. And uh, he gets extremely tired, as do most people with degraded THC, which is CBN. And um, wanting something for insomnia and for nighttime relief uh, we're going to be uh, going to market in the near future with a couple of high CBN uh, products. And so we're looking forward to that as well. Excellent. How, how many cannabinoids are out there that have not been found yet? Yeah, do we at least, do we know that kind of like the umbrella of, are we talking 200 here? So I've heard the number 200 thrown around a little bit, but I think there'll be more than that. It's just going to be years. You're going to have to have massive facilities and fields, really, um, to be able to get on that level Fino, huh? and, and and find things that have larger numbers of these rare cannabinoids. But because there's so much research going on, uh, Big Pharma, they're posed to just go right to synthesizing. That's their game. They know it well, and they're not going to spend a lot of time researching the things we've always done the trench work. Um, yeah. So it's going to be places like this or a little larger than this that are maybe in multiple state player can get into different weathers, different light spectrums outdoor with Whoa. massive amounts of certain pheno hunts and and see what we can conjure up to, to, to start testing for. But what? no, there's I, I'm going to think there's probably going to be more than 200. OK. And what mythical cannabinoids have you heard about but haven't found yet? Well, until that THCO, I had heard about that being like using mushrooms mixed with DMT and cannabis. Kind of sound like a K, like a special K effect as well. You kind of said body, cerebral, floating. Yep. yep. 
So, um, but now that I've tried it and I know it's out there, it's not, you know, all that it's cracked up to be, uh, <laughs> and, and especially if there's risks behind it. Totally. Um, so I don't, you know, we're, we're hearing about all different things, but I think it's people's imagination at this point, because, you know, you sit back, you smoke a joint, you wish that it tasted like this, or it tasted like that, uh, or, or that you're getting a little bit more of this or that effect out of it. So for a magical uh, cannabinoid, I mean, I'm, I'm talking something that's just cancer cure 100% yes. of the time. Yes. Let's talk about cancer. Um, so cannabis and cancer in itself, um, it has been researched uh, almost, uh, you know, on a familial sense, right? You, someone has a family friend or neighbor that is yeah. diagnosed with a form of cancer. Uh, they might come to, to you and your team and, and you might work with them on a one-to-one -one basis. But I haven't seen a whole lot of global cancer research in cannabis in the same sentence. Um, where are we at right now with cannabis and cancer? Are, is this completely solved? Is there still a lot to learn? No, from my opinion, there's a lot to learn still. It's we're seeing anecdotal results, as you said, you know, one here, one there. That hey, they beat the cancer. Specifically, skin cancers show really, really good, effective promise uh, when caught, you know, at a reasonable time. Lots of people I've seen with melanomas and and being told that that's a really bad patch of, of skin cancer, and then using cannabis oil miraculously gone. I've seen uh, a couple of people with humongous uh, deformities on their face from tumors uh, around the ear okay. section and the and the eye section and, and really bulging out, you know, four or five, six with inches weight. off their face. Uh, and over a six month, nine month treatment of both oral and topical RSO or cannabis Rick, oil. Rick Simpson um, oil. Yeah, Rick, Rick gets a lot of the credit for, for cannabis oil for, for being, you know, one of the pioneers for getting it out there. So uh, that says, you know, pretty much we, what we've coined it. Uh, but, but cannabis oil is, is phenomenal, um, miraculous things for certain cancers. And is there just a, a cannabinoid that is present in some of these oils we made and not others? And that's why we're not curing it all of the time? Or is there one that just has yet to be discovered because it's so micro in most things that we're gonna have to have huge amounts of that strain to, to extract and get, you know, isolate that out of it? We don't know yet, that would be wonderful. I mean, because we get teased with these tastes of, but no, I mean, I don't think we're even anywhere close to saying we've, it, it's it, it, but it's showing tons of promise, more promise than any, anything else that I know of. I mean, mm -hmm. every time they think they've got a pharmaceutical drug that shows promise, uh, two years later, if you've taken this and you're experiencing that now, or your loved one yeah, died Yeah, the law of this, commercials. Exactly. You know, now you have to call this number. Um, so we, we don't have to worry about that, you know, with the exploration of, of cannabinoids. And I, I hope that we do find this, this magical cancer cannabinoid, because that's where we see the most result. Uh, other than with seizures, I think now, but it's it's so sporadic and hit and miss that we can't just say we're we're there. We got to find out why it worked for them and not for for, for the other. Um, right. But that would be my my favorite magical you know cannabinoid. Yeah. No. A, a cure to cancer. Um, I think that uh, it, as you put it, we have a lot of progress made towards that direction. I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done, and we're being held back. Um, but I am curious on a global uh, landscape, who comes to mind as far as the leader? Is it, uh, could you name a, a country, an organization, or an individual that is dedicating their life or their career to curing cancer with cannabis? Um, no, I, I can't right now for an individual. I mean, Dr. Mishulam has been the Israel, most impactful, yeah. right? And Israel has the most amount of adult and, and, human clinical trials on cannabis than every other country combined. They've not been naive and kept it suppressed and followed the U.S.'s lead on the international treaty and bullshit. So um, I, I think they're the leaders still, but yeah. even even them, you know, still yet, they don't have the cure for cancer yet. They've been doing a lot of laboratory analysis. When you speak with so a lot of the Israelis that are heavily involved in cannabis industry there, it's definitely not our sector where we're going for dispensaries and, mm -hmm. and recreational use, 
uh, which, which, you know, I love and I'm totally in favor of it. It's 100% medical for them. And they really want to get to the bottom of things and they're clinically driven. They, they are conducting more clinical trials than anybody in a lot of things, even outside of cannabis. Um, so I, I, I think they're the global leader for things. Spain's been doing some good research on mm-hmm. medicinal cannabis. Um, and, and then it, I think it's just people who are in our space who have passions like I do that once you have your facility running well oiled, that R and D department, that's, that's where it's at. I mean, that's what you're looking to do and use and partner with people and doctors that are willing to assist you. So we've been blessed that when Steve, um, you know, was operating the certification facilities, the university of Michigan wanted to apply for a cannabis research grant. Uh, to the National Institute of Health. So they got wind of Steve's for certification facilities. His wife is a, is a, a physician and um, they came to him and, and asked if he had any interest to talk to Mary Sue Komen, who was the president of U of M at the time about assisting in this grant. He said, well, absolutely. What's it gonna look like? Mm-hmm. And what they wanted to do is a research data collection study off, based off of a thousand person control group for two year period of time. And so they applied for a $2.2 million grant, uh, was denied the first year and then beefed the application up a little bit, resubmitted, you're allowed to do it twice and was granted it the second year. So we participated in support with the University of Michigan here, a thousand person data collection study. And now they're looking to move forward with, they can't bring, they, well, they don't wanna bring cannabis onto the university yet uh, on, on their property because of their federal funding and things mm-hmm. that they get. They don't wanna have that. They removed. wanna do a voucher program now with us though, so they can do a, a, a clinical trial because things can be standardized, especially in oral forms. If we make a lot that's tested by a third party testing lab, we can standardize the the dosing in the material to be provided Mm -hmm. we can do placebo we can do cbd we can do any cannabinoid we isolate right now um you know so on and so forth we can do an oral you can do a smokable uh they just conducted a smokable cbd trial at wayne state university here uh in conjunction with opiate withdrawal because they operate the largest free opiate clinic in the state being that the university is located in downtown detroit uh, mm. More people go there for Suboxone and for Methadone than all the other areas of the state. Uh, so they did a, a, there's a Schedule One doctor there that we've spoke with on several occasions, uh, Dr. Greenwald, and he runs their research and development uh, area. So he's done cocaine trials. He's done uh, MDMA for end of life uh, trials. Mm, I've heard and of that So one. he was most recently doing a smokable CBD for opioid withdrawal. And so we look to partner with people like that to continue the, the, the medical research, you know, that we can impact and be a part of. Uh, our passions can continue on to hopefully finding or assisting in finding through data or any other role we can play uh, from our level, those magical cannabinoids. And so, you know, that's, that's really where we feel uh, we can play the largest role and, and, and have the, the most weight uh, to impact. Definitely. And we started with genetics, we went to cannabinoids. Now let's talk about effects. Um, What do we know with such limited research, but also we've been growing for a long time. uh, What do we know about the effects of certain cannabinoids on individuals today? So again, I think I I keep going back to these few projects that we're currently working on because they're Mm -hmm. on the top of my mind. But we know that um, when, when we use different cannabinoids like CBN, we, we're going to drive most people to feel lethargic, tired, relaxed, couch locked, if you will. Um, and so as we add heightened amounts of these into uh, our cartridges or even lacing into a joint, we find that through and through most of the time with most people not being told what's, th- what's in there, these are the side effects that they experience. So I think we we find CBN is going to play a role in in sleep and in uh, relaxation. Okay. Uh, THCV can be more psychoactive and more cerebral, and we find it to be creative. We find that when you mix that with linalool 
when you mix that with a couple of other terpenes that, you know, these are what people are seeing as their daytime formulation. Right. Um, this combination of about five or six terpenes um, and then, you know, THCV. Uh, so I think there's really good stuff there. CBC, we get mixed reviews on, but it seems to be a really good anti-tumor from what we're seeing studies out of Israel on. So maybe you're going to end up making CBC mixed with uh, your cancer cocktail so that you can help to shrink or, or bring cell death to tumor cells, conglomerations, mm. whatever they may look like. Um, let's see. Uh, CBD acid seems to also be somewhat creative. If you don't decarb your CBD oil enough, we were making like a 50% decarbed oil to keep people going during the daytime and reap some of the medicinal rewards of CBDA, which could be antifungals as well, okay. um, antispasmatic. Um, so it, 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 we just, we have to figure out how all of the cannabinoids work with the receptors. And basically one of the studies that was conducted was taking pure distillate at about 98 to 99% crystalline uh, and having THCA smoked at that level and then making a 50% cocktail with the presence of terpenes and other micros and people claim to be five to seven times more intoxicated off the 50% THC Delta 9 uh, cocktail than they were off the straight, you know, distillate almost every time or isolate. So uh, it's, it's, I mean, undisputable that you need the terpenes in, in the microcannabinoids to tell and interpret through receptors what we want the cannabinoids to do and how they perform. Um, so to get, you know, daytime and nighttime things, that's what everybody's after, even microdosing now. So those effects, yep. You know, we're looking for the ability to slightly stimulate, reduce inflammation and pain for our daytime wake up. I mean, you mm -hmm. want to take that at breakfast and, and as you're getting the, you know, the aches and the pains worked out by, you know, the halfway to the drive to, to work, you're feeling like a million dollars and that's what we need. Um, it, it's just more individual research people unfortunately we try to give out free data sheets now after that collection at the dispensary and everybody will take one and, and almost never do they bring it back and you don't want to harass them and lose them as a customer but well, did you bring your sheet back well, how did it work how did it work but when we were in that gray area of medicinal dispensaries if we would require it people would still do it because they wanted to come they had nowhere else to go um, as there became more competition, people find it to be bothersome, but there's no way for us to learn. Like I know what that terpene profile is in the flower that they're buying every time. So if they would just fill out 10 or 12 questions, we could really begin to hone in on, on what we see because it's kind of a mix when we start making cocktails of what is uplifting, what's relaxing, what's, mm -hmm. uh, so I would say, you know, at this time, CBN for relaxation, THCV uh, for inspiration, creativity, um, a CBG for anxiety with a little CBC in it, and maybe we're going to see CBC for for using uh, to reduce tumors. Wow. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about the future. Um, what does your future expansion look like at Pinkana? So we have 184 acres here. We want to expand next year into an outdoor cultivation uh, where we can get one pull a year, maybe two with auto flowers and one part of that outdoor grow. Um, then we really get enough biomass to start pulling more oil and doing isolations mm -hmm. uh, and more in-depth micro analysis and terpene analysis because there's some rare terpenes that we don't find in all other you know natural botanicals that we're starting to find. Um, what are some of those terpenes that you're starting to find? more identification of uh of of these new terpenes too um so you'll get me lying right now i i, I leave that for the lab guys over okay there. I, I just know <laughs> that they're saying hey we've ran it against 26 of these terpenes that we yeah. have that we can test for and it's not there but it, it it's by its makeup it's it's some form of a terpene yeah. so we're taking these back we don't know what to call them yet 
and we're using those in in some new carts and seeing hey, i mean what effects are you getting off these things we haven't seen we know they're not in the normal panel of of the right. you know 12 28 you're actually discovering them and as they're being integrated into your current menu you are just now getting kind of that validation i mean you need a patient group of, 100%. of what I mean, they do and because it and only does effects. the same thing to me and then after i've done it a few times i'm not gaining anymore now i know how yeah. it works on me but i need to know how it works on two thousand people yeah so um we haven't been able to say that you know i should have brought a list of the things with the lab guy or head of we'll, we'll link the, them uh, in the description below um but that's i mean going outside and expanding i remember we were talking about that um while we were out there that outdoor crop um, so, giving you more opportunities to to learn and discover. Exactly, and then, then what we say directly, we see is that when we grow something indoors, the terpene profile is uh, greatly enhanced when we hit put versus putting it, you know, when we get it out into the natural sun in the glass house or in the hoop house. So mm -hmm. that gives us a little more inspiration to want to see what we're getting in direct sunlight without any of the artificial lighting, you know, manipulating the terpene profile. Um, in addition to the outdoor grow, we're looking to do uh, four additional greenhouses to the east of our current configuration, which would give us another 60,000 square feet of glass house. Uh, we're looking to expand our processor. Uh, it's currently 10,000 square feet. We're looking to expand that another 12,000 where we wow. can put an additional uh, R&D lab in there for analysis where we can hire a technician to do more in-house R&D. We have an in-house lab room assigned for the grow space here in, mm -hmm. in the large building that we showed you. Um, unfortunately, they won't let us bring the products back from the processor after we have done any kind of process to it. So if we start to make oil and then pull the terpenes out of that and, and, and want to test that, they will not let us bring it back into our flower laboratory for R&D here. Uh, so we have no choice but to either build another uh, in-house lab over there or we're going to have to send it out for testing and if you send it out for testing as i was mentioning you send it to any of the state labs most of them are only testing for what's required there are a couple who are very scientifically driven and so they're doing you know 28 or 29 uh and are supposedly going to offer 40 terpenes that they can test for in the near uh, future but at the time they're doing 28 or 29 or they're doing 12 we send the sample out without testing in-house, we can't tell what the rest of it is. Right. Um, but as they gain standards and, and, and better means of testing, we're gonna be able to figure out what some of these, you know, more unique uh, terpenes that we're finding are. Uh, it, so we'd like to complete that expansion. Uh, and in there, we'd be doing a pill uh, manufacturing room uh, on top of what we were able to feature when you guys came out. Mm -hmm. um, for doing pressed pills, for doing gel caps, and for kind of like a capsules. multivitamin, or where are you exactly. going with that? Well, so we're going to, once we, you know, we have our two platforms. We'd like to yeah. get this third platform for anxiety, and now we can put that platform into a pressed sublingual. That is incredible. That will be Dave. quick, quick dissolving. We can put it into a gel cap that'll be swallowed, quick dissolving, or we can put it in a standard capsule because with a standard capsule, you can fill both sides of that thing, one with time release and one with instantaneous mm -hmm. release. So we can give a multitude of different uh, durations of onset mm -hmm. and uh, means of delivery. And so that'll be a pretty vital you know, room to have. But right now they're saying that's probably about 4% of the market is, is capsules and, and sublinguals. I, I could see that, that growing I, significantly. I, say, I think we could really push that up to every bit of eight or 10% of the market. Oh yeah. If you just get into the assisted living homes, we feel like that, that's that's eight to 10% of the market once it's it's, Right. Promoted properly, just the, the effects that you can bring to the elderly who are, are scared. They're the biggest group of people that fell into the propaganda and they That's what they grew try. up with. Exactly. That's all they know. So if you hear now their niece, their granddaughter, their daughter, their son is getting relief, now they're ready. I mean, that's they're exactly what happened questions. to me at the church, you know. Yeah. They found out that my mom made this phenomenal comeback from a series of strokes. She went in to the mm. hospital to have a, a open heart surgery to have a valve replaced. She was supposed to be in there for four days and she ended up in there for 67 days. And she was in ICU wow. for 55 of them. So uh, through cannabis oil and cannabis lozenges, 
she made a phenomenal recovery, but it, you know, it took some time and, and I didn't expect to see, you know, what happened with her. So uh, after they show up to church telling the story, I mean, now people, they trust them firsthand and now they're, they're willing to, you know, ask and, and do some more homework themselves. And so you're going to see that, uh, you're going to see more and more people, um, wanting to, to utilize, I think a capsule or a, or a, a quick, you know, releasing sublingual or something. Um, and, and so we think we should have, you know, some room for that in the processing facility. Most definitely. And are you looking to expand, uh, beyond the breeders and, and your genetic archive right now? Are you looking to work with other outside breeders in the near future? So I would say, you know, they're never going to say no. We're never going to, you know, not extend an olive branch or keep a bridge open. So it's not out of the question. But, you know, we're pretty robust right now with 11 uh, different brands here. Mm -hmm. From everything that I know from, from a licensed cultivator standpoint, we offer more brands out of our campus than anybody else uh, in the state of Michigan. So And the uh, country. I mean, I've toured several states, over 30 farms. I have not seen... Um, as robust of a facility and menu as Pinkana. Well, thank you. I mean, again, lifetime of commitment and love and passion, and that's what you get out of it. And, and with a little luck and a lot of God's blessing. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 great. And we look forward to expanding, you know, to phase three and phase four. We make our own power here as we, you know, talked about on the episode. Mm -hmm. And we'll just keep building out additional generators to, to be able to produce at, you know, a really good uh, cost and, and be as low impact as we can be. And, um, you know, sky's the limit, I hope. I mean, yeah. I think more and more people are going to get involved in cannabis. We see every time cannabis goes recreational in a state, alcohol consumption goes down. And I'm not opposed to alcohol. I love to brew beer. I've brewed, I've brewed some wine and, and I do enjoy a, a drink here and there, but I, I certainly favor cannabis over it. I think it's a much safer, you know, recreational thing to use. And it, and it comes with all of the medicinal benefits that, you know, a human being could ask for. So uh, I think that as, you know, more and more uh, people open their minds to it, the, the sky is the limit. Totally. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. You are a wealth of knowledge. Is there anything that we missed? Anyone that you want to give a shout out to? Oh, well, I, I want to give a shout out to Brett. He's been a, you know, a good friend in the cannabis industry for a long time. And for Ash uh, with Elite that he's introduced me to, and they've always been open to allowing us out at their farms. And, uh, you know, it helped to, to add to the inspiration and to, you know, you know, show that it's, it's achievable to my mm. team as we go out there and, and visit. So I give a shout out to them. I certainly give a shout out to Greg at ChemDog and Kevin at Canarado for, you know, having faith in, in not only friendship with us, but us repping their brands. And, and so, and to Darren McCarty, uh, for him helping to push into the, the sports world and the sports locker room. We're hoping to break barriers there. He's got a hemp roll on right now. Uh, being hemp, he's, he's got it through the, the Players Association. We think wow. it's going to be permitted in the near future to be present in all locker rooms. He's been talking with some Major League Baseball friends and others. and So to be able to get a, a marijuana product, or I guess more uh, professionally stated, a cannabis product, even if it is hemp for now, uh, being you know recognized as therapeutic and, and into these professional athletes' lives, I think that's wonderful. So I give a shout out to Darren for that. And uh, you know, uh, there's some other people and maybe there'll be another episode and we can talk some more oh, yeah. and uh, show you the expansions that uh, we're talking about now. I would love that. Well, thank you again, Dave, and the entire Radical team and Pincana. Um, it takes a village, right? So thanks for joining me today and, and sharing your wisdom with the world. Hey, I really appreciate you having us and uh, I enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us on this Can of Cribs podcast today. And thank you to Foop for making this episode possible. If you want to support them and support this show, head on over to foopcana.com. And thank you to all of our fans. Yep, that's you. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below. Happy growing.